When a researcher stumbled upon the fossil of a small mammal called a multi-tuberculate in the late 1960s in the foothills of southwestern Montana, it came as a shock. You see, at that point, fossil collecting around the Rocky Mountains had been going on for just over a century. So paleontologists had a pretty good idea of what animals they should expect where. And multi-tuberculates, a group that first appeared in the fossil record about 165 million years ago, were extremely common until about 56 million years ago, after modern groups of mammals evolved and started to outcompete them. But these Montana rocks dated to 17 million years after most of them went extinct. And these fossils came from the foothills instead of the low-lying basins where paleontologists typically find multi-tuberculate fossils. This discovery pointed paleontologists toward the mountains, which would eventually reveal something even stranger about a group of mammals even closer to home, primates. Because it turns out, mountains have a unique effect on diversity, messing with their understanding of animals through time, and pretty much just making evolution weird. At the beginning of the Eocene Epoch, 56 million years ago, the area that's now Wyoming was as warm and wet as the modern tropics. Here, trees related to swamp-dwelling bald cypress and fruiting and flowering elms supported a novel group, our own relatives, the primates. And these primates were thriving, diversifying into a range of species. Their grasping hands and feet allowed them to navigate the canopy more easily than any mammals before them. And after many decades of collecting fossils in the American West, scientists had a pretty good sense of their evolutionary story, or so we thought. They seemed to fall into two groups, the larger lemur-like adipoids and the small tarsier-like omomyoids. The adipoids, which were fruit and leaf eaters, were represented by only a few species at any one time. While in contrast, the omomyoids were extremely diverse, evolving multiple species that were highly specialized for eating insects or small vertebrates, as well as fruits and seeds. In North America alone, there were almost 40 genera of omomyoids between 55 and 36 million years ago, which themselves fell into two groups. The first was the anaptomorphine omomyoids, which appeared about 55 million years ago and dominated North America. These were extremely small critters. One of the smallest, trogolemur, weighed only about 50 grams, about as much as a lemon. And these little anaptomorphines could be identified by the sharp cusps on their teeth and their especially prominent fourth premolars. But within the next five million years in the Middle Eocene, they began to decline, leaving the other group, the omomyene omomyoids, more prevalent on the landscape. These omomyenes were slightly bigger, up to three kilograms in one genus, Macrotarsius. They had shorter cusps on their teeth and didn't have the prominent fourth premolar seen in anaptomorphines. Now, because there are Eocene age deposits all over North America, from Mexico to Mississippi to Canada, we could see that the omomyenes were outcompeting the anaptomorphines all over, or so paleontologists thought. Because here's the thing, these fossils had all been collected in relatively low elevation sites where sediments accumulate in basins. That began to change in the 1970s, when a group of scientists inspired by the discovery of those multi-tuberculates in Montana started looking for primate fossils in the foothills of central Wyoming. And despite being from the Middle Eocene, the foothills, sitting about 1,980 meters in elevation, revealed anaptomorphine primates that were not only surviving, but diversifying and evolving into new species. Seeking answers, researchers moved further up in elevation. And at a pass to the south around 2,200 meters high, researchers working in the 1990s collected a huge amount of fossils, including more than a dozen species of primates. They were tiny and tarsier-like in their anatomy, with subtle differences in their teeth marking all these species as distinct from one another, from Artemonius with its massive fourth lower premolars to that lemon-sized trogolemur with its small fourth premolar and diminished cusps. So this new site had substantially more species than any of the lower elevation sites dating to this time, despite those having been explored for nearly a century with many specimens collected. And these new finds included multiple genera that are usually extremely rare during this period, like Artemonius, which is among the most abundant primates here. The relative abundance we'd come to expect was basically flipped on its head. Even Omamese carteri, an omamayin that is often one of the most abundant species of that time period, was barely present. And data from the 2010s from an even higher elevation site near Yellowstone National Park at just over 3,100 meters in elevation, showed that same pattern with Omamese carteri. It was clear that these mountainous regions were different, but why? 
What could be going on to create such a different evolutionary pattern from the basins? There almost seemed to be a mismatch between the ages of the rocks and the animals found in them, which sometimes happens with a process called time averaging, where instead of representing one discrete chunk of time, sediments of different ages are mixed together. This can happen when different layers of rock or sediment are exposed along a hill, and rain erodes out the layers, which then accumulate at the bottom. And that accumulation turns into a new fossil deposit that actually represents all of the time periods exposed along the hill, not just one. So you end up with a jumble of things that don't seem like they belong together, because they actually don't belong together. But at these sites, there were well-dated layers above and below the sediments, so that couldn't really explain the pattern. So the scientists started to wonder, what if it was the mountains themselves and the environments they created that were causing these patterns? Elevation can play an important role in supporting diversity, in part because mountains often have greater environmental variation than low-lying areas. There are a few reasons for this. The changes in atmospheric conditions as you move up and down the mountains create variation, from temperature shifts to air density to UV radiation. And in mountains, there's greater topographic complexity, not just in the sense that mountains are tall, but also because they get more rain, leading to more active erosion, dividing the mountain into many different small river systems, each carving up the landscape in different ways. Which means that within a single square mile, there are more topographic changes in mountains than in low elevation areas. Not to mention the cliffs, crests, and further divisions to the environment that can happen during the tectonic processes that form mountain ranges like the Rockies. These varied environments mean more environmental niches supporting more species. And more habitat variation means it's increasingly likely that a trait might offer an animal some advantage and be selected for, which means there is a better chance that new species will evolve. So when we see higher diversity, we may be seeing the preserved evidence of the speciation caused by habitat variation. This is probably why we get the higher primate diversity at that medium elevation site. Additionally, more niches mean less competition for the same niche. So animals that may be outcompeted in low-lying areas might be able to persist longer in mountainous regions. These are called refugia, where a species survives in a small region that forms a subset of a once much larger range. So those anaptomorphines persisting longer in the foothills without getting outcompeted by the omamayins are evidence of refugia. This combination of speciation potential and refugia may lead mountains to act almost like islands, supporting isolated pockets of diversity in a similar way. And this island-like pattern might explain why there are primate species seen only at these high elevation sites. Also, some animals just prefer to live in mountains. So when we see things like Artemonius, which is typically rare in lowlands, maybe we're not seeing an uncommon animal like scientists once thought. We're just seeing habitat preference. But there's one final piece to consider about the world in which these Eocene creatures live the mountain-building events themselves. In fits and bursts, ranges like the Rocky Mountains appeared on the landscape through faulting and folding that lifted and shaped the Earth's crust. And these events were often accompanied by episodes of volcanic activity that deposited thick layers of igneous rock. While there's debate about the exact timing, much of the Rockies were the product of a mountain-building episode that unfolded between 80 to 40 million years ago. So during the time the anaptomorphines and omamayines were evolving and competing for resources, mountains were actively forming and dividing the landscape. And part of this activity included nearly 15 million years of periodic eruptions in Wyoming itself that cast ash and volcanic material for hundreds of miles in all directions. This single volcanic group alone is responsible for depositing about 1.5 kilometers of sediments in parts of Wyoming, only increasing the effects of the mountains on the animals living in them. So as this complex landscape comes into focus, it becomes clear that there's still a lot to be learned. And this is tricky in mountains, which have steeper gradients, big erosion potential, and overall poor preservation. But what we have learned from the fossil record of these unique environments, from multi-tuberculates to Eocene primates, is that extinction isn't always uniform. It isn't always an on-off switch. It wasn't until scientists found the anaptomorphines surviving and speciating in the mountains of the Middle Eocene that we realized they hadn't gone extinct, they just adapted. So while the original story of anaptomorphines being replaced by omamayans was far more complex than it had seemed, it was also more interesting. And expanding the fossil record upward can allow us to learn new lessons from the mountains.
Now, as we've learned, early primates not only lived in North America, they thrived. So what happened to those ancient relatives of ours? Find out in our episode, What Happened to Primates in North America? And mountains of thanks to this month's eontologists. Addie, Annie, and Eric Higgins, Carl Wolfel, Jake Hart, John Davison Ng, Juan M., Melanie Lamb Carnavale, Nico Robin, Raphael Hase. By becoming an eonite at patreon.com slash eons, you can get fun perks like access to behind-the-scenes content, including clips from Eon shoots. And as always, thanks for joining me in the Ken Barnes studio. Subscribe to youtube.com slash eons for more evolutionary escapades. Man, scientists, choose easier words. Just kidding. <laughs>